Warning! Unlawful duplication of this video may cause riots, geological upheavals, climate change, and unnatural congress between species. Besides, you can easily purchase this video for download at relaxharder.com. In lesson one, we learned about proper alignment and posture. In lesson number two, we learned how to extend our alignment into moving extremities. In lesson number three, we are going to learn about movement of that structure by learning how to pivot on the three crucial axes, the left hip, the right hip, and the center line. From Uji posture, we relax the head and neck, sink the shoulders, drop the elbows, sink the chest, relax the back, relax the waist all the way around, allowing the pelvis to hang from the waist like a rock hanging from a bungee cord. Loosening up the lower back, opening the back, dropping the tailbone under without contracting the abdominal muscles, but instead by allowing the weight to settle into the thighs. With the thighs doing all of the work, the rest of the body can relax and just balance like a string of pearls balanced on end. And the feet relax, the knees relax, the hips relax, and the more you activate your thighs, the less involved the other muscles will need to be and the more relaxed your hips will be. And if your hips are relaxed, that will allow for more natural movement, rotation, and also allow you to stabilize the waist so that we can breathe naturally with the Dan Tian. Then the hands rise, being careful not to tighten up the back, but rather relax and open the back even more, allowing the arms to extend, and then shoulders sinking, elbows dropping, the hands lower, and the body lowers here. And when we get to this position, the palms are down, and even in this position, we're still thinking of sinking the shoulders and dropping the elbows and sitting the wrists, but not forcefully flexing the wrists, but thinking about the wrists extending downwards. The next movement, first part of lesson three, is Pang. This is where the right arm becomes round at about shoulder level, with the fingertips about eye level or lower, and the left hand palm down, extending out forwards just a little, and pivoting on the left hip, and the right toe turns out. That's Pang. Then the left hip comes around the right hip, then twisting the waist, holding the ball, the left foot steps toward the front, place the heel, then the toe, and the left hand rises round, and Pang. There left arm round. Pang is an onomatopoetic expression which translates into English as boing or pang or bump and it, it requires the body to be relaxed and aligned vertically with the center of the earth so that any outside force on the forearm or the hand or anywhere else in the body for that matter gets redirected through a series of arcs and uh, spiral structures in the body and gets redirected into the earth so that if someone were to push on your forearm, they would feel as though they were pushing a mountain. Okay. This movement is fairly simple. You're taking a step and rounding your arm. However, there are some very important elements to this posture that we must understand if we're to understand how this works as a martial art, where the power comes from, and uh, as an exercise, learning how to develop strength in our legs, loosen the core, improve the health and structure of the body and the bones, 
and learning how not to fight ourselves. From this position, next the right shoulder sinks down even more, the elbow drops even more, that causes the right arm to float up. And it floats up into this nice round shape, round and comfortable, as if you were hugging a tree. Right arm round and relaxed. You don't want the elbow up, you don't want the shoulder lifting up, the shoulder goes down, the elbow drops down and outwards. And you want to find that proper position, that good alignment for the arm, so that the elbow is neither back too far, nor forward too far, but right in the middle, that place where it settles comfortably, where it will... And the left hand, the shoulder sinks, the elbow drops, the hands extend and the fingers extend, and it will we'll go forward just a little bit, like it's reaching along the floor, like you're going underneath the floorboards. Next, we're going to turn out the right toe, but we're going to do it by pivoting on the left hip. The mistake people make is they stand like this and they turn their right toe out, like that, tensing up the hip and pushing the left hip outwards. And you also don't want to shift to one side too far and leave your hip out past your toe and past your supporting foot. Instead, what we do is we increase the amount of weight on the left thigh, sinking the left hip a little backwards and pushing down so that the, the weight is in the left thigh. Imagine you're going to try to push the earth away with your left foot. So you line up with the left foot and you push down. Then you move your right hip backwards without moving your left hip. So if you think of planting your left hip and the pelvis pivots around the left hip bone and the right hip moves backwards, like so. That way you turn the toe out, you maintain the solid structure on your supporting leg, and you don't compromise the internal structure of the body. So the hand floats up, weight into the left thigh, push down with the left thigh, well, relax the waist even more, and move your right hip backwards. As you move the right hip back, you let your right toe turn out, pivoting the foot on the heel. Be careful not to do this. See how I move my hip off to the side? That will twist your knee and you'll pronate, you'll put the weight into the ball of your foot, into your big toe, or in the inside of the foot. But if you keep this thigh lined up and the right hip moves backwards, pivoting around the left hip socket, then this is solid and this becomes the fulcrum, the axis around which you are turning. So think of it as a door, and the door, the hinge is right here. So with the hinge right here, this is the fulcrum, and this is the load-bearing side of the lever. The power is actually here. This hand comes up to engage, but the real power is on this arm. You can turn the toe as the hand rises. The right hip drops back. Now, your right knee is over your right heel. If you did not move your right hip backwards, or you did not sit your hips, then you'll find your right toe, your right knee over your right foot, or over your toe. So you want to try to drop the right hip back, and there. And just from doing this, my left thigh is really, really burning. I could fry an egg on my left thigh right now, it's so hot. Now, you'll notice my lower back is still open because the thigh is holding the weight. I'm not doing this. Now, I push down with my right thigh. And as I push down with my right thigh, I try to pick the weight out of my left foot. So I, I imagine that I'm, imagine you're putting your hand on a table and you're pushing down on the hand, with the hand and you're trying to lift your whole body off the floor just by pushing down on the extended arm. It's a little bit like that. I push down with my right thigh and that allows me to relax my right hip, and it allows the right hip to turn, to, and to relax, and to drop. And by doing that, I allow the pelvis to now pivot around the right hip. This was the fulcrum, now this becomes the fulcrum. And I'm going to peel the weight off the back heel by, by moving my knee forward. So I take the weight off my back foot by moving my knee forward, moving my hip forward, and then bringing it around to here. I will drop my knee down, reach, let it reach for the floor in front of my left toe. I'll drop the knee down, reach for the floor in front of my left toe, and then when my weight is really solidly on my right foot, then I can bring this left hip all the way around in an arc to here. By dropping the right hip backwards, that creates enough room for this 
pelvis to come forward, around, and then you twist your waist. You twist your waist. So the, the waist turns around the central axis, and by twisting like this, you help to balance your pelvis so that you can pick the left foot up. And when you get to here, you can't pick up the left foot because there's, no, there's, there's still a little bit of weight on it. So you twist your waist. There, keeping it vertical, keeping the lower back open. If your waist is tense, it's going to be very difficult to do that. So keep the lower back open, twisting your waist around the center line. Then, weight right on the right thigh, a lot of weight on the right thigh. And you drop the knee down, let it reach for the floor, and then bring the foot in. And that is a thigh cooking exercise. Then step out with the heel, then the toe, and now when the left knee is in line over the left heel, then you push down with the left thigh, and that allows you to bring more weight onto the left leg. So you push down with the left thigh, that relaxes the hip, and begins the rotation of the pelvis uh, around the left hip. So you end up with a similar idea here. The hip is here, the right hip goes around like this. And the right hip cannot go in a straight line without pushing the knee around. And you don't want to push the knee yet. You want to keep this really solid fulcrum right here. This is going to be crucial for developing power and from a martial point of view later on. Also for speedy and agile footwork and for good balance. So if you want to avoid slipping on the ice, practice this way. The ribs, he makes himself nice and solid. Maybe he can withstand the impact, but if I'm applying momentum, then he's going to have a hard time uh, dealing with that. But if he relaxes and allows his body to pivot around the center line, if I am even a slight bit off his center, he will naturally rotate. In the if he's solid and tense and I push his shoulder, I'm going to move his center of gravity. If he holds his arms up and they are tense, then I can push his arm and move his center of gravity. If he is relaxed from practicing Tai Chi, I will push him and instead of moving his center relative to his base of support, this push gets neutralized and gets redirected downwards, so I end up pushing into his foot. If you think about a log floating in the water, and you try to keep your balance on that log, you have to be right on the center of that log in order to avoid flipping the log over. He, he can still redirect it into the ground, but I have to be able to stay on his center. It's more and more challenging the more relaxed he is. Turning around the center line. So this is the fulcrum. I come in and push, you turn. If you were tense and pulling that way, there, then I have your arm and I can control your center. But if you keep the palm down and extend that way, then I grab your arm, try to control it, I just uproot myself more. Left hand rises, and here, the left hip becomes the fulcrum and the right hip moves around. There's a lot of power in this. And oh, I'll drop the left hip and the right hip goes around. Tongue. And he uproots me with no problem at all. How much effort? Brilliant. So two fingers are enough to uproot me. I would weigh him by about 100 pounds. 140. I'm 240. Step to the right, just about the, the width of a pelvis. Right there. There. He is now supporting my weight. This is what happens when you keep one hip still and you move the other. This is what a lot of people are doing when they're doing martial arts. They're trying to use force on the wrong side of the lever. They're trying to do it in a way where they can feel the muscle working. But if you go to the other end, you don't feel the effort. It feels too easy. It feels like it shouldn't work because you're, you're not doing anything. Okay? And that's exactly what happens here. He moves that end of the lever and that uproots me very easily. And there will be no great increase in pressure here because it's transferring momentum, not kinetic energy. If you tried swinging this arm as fast as you could and knock me over with it, okay, you're going to uproot yourself. But if instead you drive a truck at me at 30, just think about doing it. There, that's uprooted me already. That's how much motion is required to uproot me. This is why we talk about Tai Chi's internal power uh, and people see demonstrations and they say, oh, it's fake, the guy didn't do anything. Well, he did something, it's just very small and it's not what you'd expect. Well, as I try to recover, he pivots on the left hip. Like that. When you're learning this, it's as surprising to the person who is applying the power as the person who is receiving it. 
The more effort I use, the more difficult it is going to be until I use a lot of effort and it becomes impossible. But if I use less and less effort, I just use proper leverage. There. Say so strong like bull, smart like streetcar. And thinks of countering with the other hand. Now I pivot around the right leg. As he punches, pivot on the left hip. Then I pivot on the right hip and step. And now I pivot on the left hip. Instead, I just move my right hip that way and my left hip stays still. Hands rise, hold the ball, step. Pang. Pang. Being very, very careful not to break your partner. He punches. Good. He got me. Again. See how careful he's being? He's punching with real intent. He's aiming for my face. But when he realizes that he's going to hit me, he stops. He pulls it back. And he does it at great cost to his momentum. So he tenses up and he uses his body mass to reverse the, the power of that punch. Thank you very much. There. If I move quickly enough, then he gets redirected. Okay. So as he punches, ha, like that, that redirects his intent first over there and takes the energy out of his punch. If he does that and I don't do that, he's going to hit me. But as he punches and I go, whoa, like this, I change the fulcrum. That gets him off balance. He's now punching and looking at me out of the corner of his eye. I have this to stop his momentum towards me. And this hand has done this to his mind. Okay, feel that? So what does that feel like? What, what happens <laughs> what, is it ha what happens to your balance as that happens? Go slowly and see if you can describe it. So here, it goes that, that way. that's right, your balance goes that way. So now you're vulnerable on this angle, mm -hmm. just a little. So as you throw the punch, go here, that stretches you out and changes the, the amount of power that you have from the punch. It takes a lot of the power out of the punch, just redirecting the vector a little bit. Now, don't think that you're going to be able to go, ooh, like this every time, and he's going to fall for it. He won't. Trust me. So as he punches, fulcrum, okay, I'm on the left side. He's going to track me, but his punch was going this way and is now going this way, and that's not the strongest uh, angle for his punch. So even if I get hit, I'm not going to get hit hard. It's not going to be debilitating. And I'll be expecting it. So as he punches, there. The punch is still coming at my face, but it's coming at me this way now, as opposed to this way. Now he punches. There. Didn't have to do nearly as much work that time, because I got there sooner. So again, that's the flinch response. Okay. That time, as he punched, it redirected the energy downwards a little. So he punches. There. So, step, and Um, okay? Yes. We are not even getting into fajing or explosive power. We're not talking about Dantian power expanding and exploding. Instead, we're just using basic leverage, and that does plenty of work for you. Okay, later, we can get into <coughs> that kind of explosive power. But for the most part, we just use leverage. There. Now, you have this hand going this way, and this hand going this way. So you're splitting the energy open, which means that I could split it right, right back at you. But if you do that again, and you engage there, now this is into my center. The power here is coming up here, right into my center, into my spine, and it's uprooting my center. This is coming from that axis, right into my center, right into me. Like that. So now it's like I'm being knocked that way, rather than you're catching me. Okay. Here, you're, you're, you're like, a, like a, a mine going off. Okay, so I'm here. There, you're splitting. That's it. Now, there, you relax a little, and now it's right into my center again. Now, engage. That's it. I protect myself. Hold off. There. Good. Again. There you go. And good. Again. Change the other side now. So. Ah. 
Ah, don't panic, don't panic. Just engage the center here, All right? That's it. There you go. Now I, you've just taken the pressure off your throat by engaging here, change this fulcrum, and then right hip moves around. There. So take the pressure off, unless you panic and try to take and try to fight against it. Okay. From here, just engage, change. There. From here, turn. There you go. That's it. You notice how it engaged in my center? Right there, you had a punch right there waiting for me. So I just landed on, on that. So as I punch, there. That's it. Good. So, as you see, this opens up a world of possibilities. Uh, be very, very careful. If you break your partner, you don't get another one. Uh, do not practice this stuff without a qualified instructor. And uh, re read the disclaimer and the warning at the beginning of this video. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. More practice. <laughs>